the new album, Kiss Me, Kiss Me, Kiss Me, it's incredibly diverse. Is that purposely done? Not having been in the studio since the head on the door, um, and with me insisting that the others wrote wrote some music, I got cassettes from the others for the first time. When we went in to, to record it, there were songs like from the others, which musically I would never have written. I just don't write like that. I mean, they, they're obvious to my I'm There's a point to saying which the song which songs aren't and which are because they're all gradually worked on by the group and they all become as the group wants them to be but um, it, we never intended to make a double album when, when we started we didn't sort of think we'd make a double album but the more we kept recording and we were doing recording like two or three songs a day and they were all good and we asked think you know we got to the point where we'd recorded 25 songs and I sort of like said we'd better stop you know because we've got to sort of like I've got to sing on them we've got to mix them and it's got, we've got to make it into something coherent and I mean even now, the 18 songs that are on the album aren't the 18 songs that, if you ask the others what 18 songs they put out of the 25, they all disagree with me. It's my final choice. It's the only bit of you know, non-democracy that took place about it. Um, so, I mean, that's the reason why it's so diverse, is because there was like, input from all five, five of us, which there never has been before, not so to that was, degree. this was like more of a group record? Yeah, like The Head and the Door, I, I wrote the initial sort of music, like the s- skeleton of each song, and then the group interpreted it, but like an orchestra. Um, whereas with this one, it actually started off, you know, from a point where I thought, good grief, you know, like Paul would, Paul writes the most weird sort of pieces of music, and it's only the, like the most accepted ones I can even bear to listen to, you know. And he writes some really weird times, so it has no no concept of key or anything. It's um, but sometimes he'll have like a really good melody, and I was thinking, well, it seems pointless, you know, to disregard that when he can write really good songs. They're not like your songs, but. Once I take that and I sort of like change it a little bit, it fits into. I mean, now the umbrella under which like a Cure song fits is so enormous that I mean, it, we could we could probably for the first time do a country and western song, and I don't think people would be that that surprised. I hope we never do. Paul loves it, you see. He actually wrote a country western song and pleaded for it to be included on the album, but I haven't I haven't gone that insane yet. A lot of it sounds new, and a lot of it is. It's like in, it, we've, we've gone into areas that we've never worked in before, but at the same time. It's taken a lot of elements that we've used over the years. It's just the actual flavour of some of the songs, like particularly some of the slower songs, um, like A Thousand Hours, would be a song that I would really have loved to have written around the time of Faith. And it, you know, it was it's because it encompasses like an enormous slice of what I was feeling like at that time and how I still feel. But I think it's just it's much more accomplished now. And with a song like Shiver and Shake. That's what give me it always wanted to be, it, you know. It's, it's just like a really vicious, really angry song, and there's all bits of what we've done, but made that much better because it's that the whole group's actually started, and it's like there's input from different personalities rather than always just me. I mean, it, this is a very personal point of view. I don't suppose that other people will see it in quite the same way because they'll only be aware of it, they'll only hear it for the first time as the cure, whereas I, I'm hearing everything we do from the point when it doesn't even exist. You know, I see it right from the point when someone will give me a cassette and say, what about this? So I, I'm obviously looking at this record in a very different way. And for the first time, I'm seeing the group work as a group. I mean, for the first time ever, isn't it? We've, musically, it's never happened like this before. Um, so I'm glad that, I mean, everyone that hears it thinks it's the best thing we've done. But it's making the others horribly arrogant, though. <laughs> See, if we'd have written the songs all along, they keep saying to me. <laughs> um, the Kiss... Um, the first track is a really, really brutal opening song. Well, what kind of feel were you going for there? Just an all-out bludgeoning attack? That was, um, I mean, I worked myself up into the frame mind to do the guitar part just in one go so that it would sound like an actual piece rather than bother about drop-ins and structure and stuff. And it's just played through until it naturally ends. It's, um, I just thought it would be good to start an album with this... this it's it's got such pretty songs on it and it's generally so nice to listen to and it's quite easy to listen to I thought it'd be good you know that you have to get through you have to sort of like get through six and a half minutes of bitterness before you actually start to enjoy it it's made to appear as diverse as it can by the, the actual way the songs run into each other they're all a completely different song is a completely different song but I thought that the other extreme we could have done would to be a would would be to put a song like why can't I be you or catch or hot 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 one of the easier songs right at the head of the album and people would think oh you know this is going to be jolly and it would get the, the wrong idea I mean whatever we put at the head of the album you're going to get the wrong idea of what the record's like really 
But I mean, I think to so. myself, well, look, if I've never ever listened to the first track on the record without listening to the rest of it, even if I hate it. Generally, I think that people should be at least prepared to uh, um, listen to the first side as a whole. Right, Catch is, is like quite a, a whimsical song. Is that going to be another single? That will be the next single, yeah. I'm not loath to put out a second single from this record, and um, because there's so much disagreement about even what's on the album, that I mean, there's a, at least five different singles. I think there's probably agreement on why can't I be you. There's a, like there's a majority agreement within the group that should be the single, but um, certainly after that we, we are going to do catch because I I think it will be a nice change and it will be like a we can do a, a nice film with it with Pep and it will be like a summer record. So is is Pep the nickname you've got for uh, for Tim Pope? Yeah. Okay, now, T Tim Pope been involved in directing all of your videos for the last four years or so. In, in the current video for, uh, for Why Can't I Be You, he managed to get you dancing. Now, <laughs> how well, did he manage sort of. that? <laughs> um, well, the thing about the videos is that he always asks me what I think the video should be. He always says, go on then, tell me what you think. Nine times out of ten, what I think the video should be, he's already thought the video should be, you know, within rough, you know, broad per parameters we we think the same which is why he does our videos you know he has the same sort of visual sense as I do of the group and with um, Why Can't I Be You the whole group felt that we should do some chore choreographed dancing as it would be the last thing that people would expect from The Cure you know um, I can see why now having made it <laughs> it's uh, it's not exactly five star but the woman who was trying to teach us gave up you know she was like despairing I think it's quite funny how inept we were <laughs> you, you look at uh, look at you in the video and you're so obviously taking the dancing just so seriously it's you had to I mean like we were I was desperately concentrating all the time you know like one two one two three you know like two three two two three it's like awful it really was I mean I, I can see now why we don't you know, we've never made a choreographed video before. We'll never make another one either. But it's it it looks funny, which is what it's you know it's designed to. Why can't I be used in the in the charts at the moment? Um, is chart success that important to you now? No, it's I mean no more than it ever has been. It's it's sort of relatively important in different places because it means more or less to us in different places. It's. Um, I mean, it's it's always been immaterial, but it's, it it would be frustrating. I mean, it's difficult for me to say it, it doesn't mean anything because everything we've done has always been slightly more popular than anything we've done before. So it, it's easy for me to be very dismissive about it. But I I think that I would be very frustrated if we had less success than we have. You know, if if the records were completely ignored by the media, I, I would be a bit distraught. I think because it would. Um, it would mean that people weren't being exposed to what we were doing. I mean, I, I enjoy The Cure getting played on the radio because it means that people have to listen to it if they've got the radio on. And it's the only way to, you know... I mean, it doesn't matter if people like it or don't. I mean, I I, I dislike 99% of things I'm exposed to, so I don't see why you know, people dislike The Cure. They, they should get away from us. Um, but it's not important in the sense of, like, status or anything. I mean, in, in, in one way, we would never have had this longevity if, if we'd had chart success a few years ago because people would have, would have been too easily labelled and people would know exactly what we're like. I mean now we're able to sort of deal with it, we're much slip, m more slippery now. You know, We can sort of escape tags and things very, because I'm so used to playing the, the extremely foolish games you know, that, you, that you have to indulge in. So doing television shows and you know, the whole thing now we're much more adept at, at, at putting ourselves across exactly how we want to. We've never been overawed because we've never been desperate for that sort of attention because we've concentrated as much on playing live as we have doing anything else. I mean, I can't, on the one hand, honestly and sincerely say I worry about chart success when the last time I bought a record was, you know, probably over a year ago. So if, if that's not important to, to you, then, then have you got any yardstick by which you measure success, whether you determine, you know, oh, that was successful or that wasn't? Um, it's, it's difficult, to, I, I never really think of what we do in terms of success. I, I, I've always um, only measured what we do by what I would think of it if I stood outside of it and looked at it. And I always think that's, that's um, every facet of what we do, what, what we look like, how I conduct myself, how I'm perceived generally, and what the group does, what we sound like. The, the whole thing, I always like, sit there and I look at it in a very sort of broad way and I think if I was outside this, would I want to be in The Cure? Would I think The Cure is a good group? 
you know, do, do I think that we're doing good stuff? It's just that. I compare us to people that I like, you know, to our, our contemporaries that, that I admire, and I think, are we as good as, as, as that? I never sort of think, oh, grief, we're not in the top ten, because I look at the top ten and I think, well, I'd seriously rather hang myself than be there, you know, if I had to be like the people who are, who are in the top ten. So it's a different sort of, it's a different way of gauging what we do. I mean, it, it, I'm, I'm aware of us being successful, and and I mean it. It, it would have to please you. I, I I would be lying, sort of shamefacedly, if I said it didn't, because it's obviously going to, um, because it means that we're being heard. You know, we're doing something that's being heard by more people. But I still feel that I'd rather Bacure did something and it was liked for reasons that that I like it. I I would rather have a smaller audience that we meant more to than a big audience that we meant nothing to. It's um, that's just sort of part of my nature, which is why we've always been sort of slightly outside of the mainstream. I think we always will be, even if we sold 10 million records, I don't think we'd ever be accepted as a mainstream group. Right. Um, in, the, in torture, you know, what, what actually happens to the person there? Because that's, that's, you know, he goes from something light like catch, then boom, we're at, at it again in torture. Yeah, that's, um, that's just sort of like a bondage song a bit, I think, really. It sounds torture. like you're into like an S&M tale. Yeah, yeah, it is a bit. Better not go into that too deeply. <laughs> uh, that reflects just another bizarre facet of the group, one which will be, you know, brought to light probably as this year drags on. I mean, I, I've written all the words to the record, but in, on a few of the songs, I've, I've again, I've, I've taken phrases or senses. I've asked the others for, for bits of words so that I can get, um, because I mean, I realise that the, the the record does reflect a group much more now. I mean, in the past, I've I've often said that, and really felt that a lot of it is just me because I've been writing the music and writing the words and doing the interviews, and it's, um, the group lineup sort of just changed from time to time, and there's never been that sort of stability where I can honestly say, oh, this this is a group. But with this record, I mean, it it is as much the others as it is me. You know, I mean, so the, I couldn't expect to have a, an entire album of words which they disagreed with or which they weren't happy with. I mean, I could have, I suppose. It would have been a bit pointless. They wouldn't have felt as happy with it. Um, so some of the songs reflect what the others think as well. But, I mean, I've actually written them be, because I suppose I'm more ad adept at writing than, than they are. Do you find it easy to write, then? I did for this record, yeah. I, I don't normally, and never in the past. I mean, beyond a certain point, I've, I always reach a, a sort of, I, I, get, I get stuck. But this time, I, I didn't at all, I just... In fact, I wrote more songs than we had recorded. I wrote 27 songs. I wrote for two songs that we never got round to recording. I mean, I don't know why. It just all sort of came tumbling out. It's, it's quite odd. I think, again, because I haven't written a song since In Between Those and Close to Me. I mean, it's a long time. It's like two years since we recorded that. It's a lot of things have happened to me and a lot of sort of been stored up inside me and I've also been writing in that time as well it's not as like I just sat down and wrote the entire album in, mm. in a day uh, well I mean I, I tend to write all this I've just got into the habit of writing all the time you know, I mean most of it's awful but I mean if, even if I come up with one page out of a hundred that I like you know it makes it worthwhile the track uh, If Only Tonight We Could Sleep it sounds as if you're an insomniac are, are you uh, a nocturnal creature? Yeah, I am. I'm more and more, I, I seem to be. I, I never go to bed before five anymore. I just can't sleep before five. I've always preferred the um, night time I mean, since I was about sort of fifteen years old, just because it was it's much quieter, you know, and it's, there's less going on. It's just uh, e easier to sort of sit and do things. Not particularly as I don't really like. Uh, sunlight very much, and I burn. So, I don't know. I, I, I do prefer the night, though. but not in the sort of like a you know. Um, it's much more mysterious or anything. It's it's really just because it's quieter. I prefer it. There haven't been too many uh, sitar sounds on a Cure record before, have there? No. <laughs> Whose idea was it to put them on? Um, again, it's just a, an underused sound. It's only because we've got this keyboard and that's. Got, had a really good sitar sound in it that we decided to use, and I've been listening to a lot of Ravi Shankar as well recently. Someone said, "Oh, it's very sixty, you know, very nineteen sixty-seven, but it isn't. It's very sort of like fourteenth-century India." I, I feel more than nineteen sixty-seven. You uh, weren't able to get a real sitar player in there. Um, I've got a sitar, but I, I can't, I can't play it very well, and we didn't really want to get anyone in from the outside to play it on anything. We we did have 
there's two bits of sex on it, but that was just by chance. You know, that was just because I was drunk in a barn. This bloke happened to be playing. I invited him back to the studio to play on the record. So I didn't remember very much about it the next day, but it sounds really good. What tracks was that? Uh, hey You and Ice and Sugar. Right. It was just when we were in Nassau. I just... This this bloke was just wailing away. And it just seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> it, it, it was a good idea. Anyway. I shouldn't say that. So, what's the, what's the story behind uh, how beautiful you are? Because there's there's like the the weary man with greyish eyes and and all that. Um, that's from a that's the literary one on the record. It's from a Baudelaire short story. Someone gave me a book of Arthur Rambone, Baudelaire, and Verlaine short stories and poems and I read through them all and that one just really struck me because I'd actually written a song like that um, around the time we were doing Faith about how you think that you really know someone and you, you, you really love someone then you suddenly discover that they they can react to something you find very important they react in a totally different way and you can't believe that it's the same person um, and I had a set of words that, that, that had that sort of idea and when I read this story I just thought you know, I mean, it's the same as anything, nothing's new it's all like different ways of I, I always feel of reflecting the very basic sort of emotions. I don't think I've ever discovered anything that someone hasn't discovered before. But um, everything's rediscovery anyway. So it was just like putting that idea. Once I read it, I thought it's really it's a good idea actually having it so that you take it down to one instant. I tried doing it into a very general sense of not understanding someone. But then I thought to actually take one particular incident and write a song. Is, that was about the most difficult song to write because I wanted to get it just right so that it sounded like a song rather than just like a literary exercise but it's I think it's turned out really really good that one I'm pleased with it I mean is, is writing for you like re real self-discipline I mean do you have to work like work and work and work at it no I I, I write and I write really fast and I just if I don't if I can't think of what I want to put in something but I know the idea I just write I'd write in the side, you know, in the margin, what idea I want, and I'd, but I'd never sort of like bother stopping the flow to worry about rhyming or something. Then I'll read it back and I'll put in dropping words, and I do. It. I mean, a lot of it's very haphazard. I mean, that sounds like I do it in a very cultured, very skillful manner. I don't at all. It's quite often I'll go out and start singing with with a gap in a song, and I'll just sing, you know, like I'll either repeat a couple of lines or I'll think, ah, this is it, and I'll start stop the tape and I just fill it in. Um, there's all different ways. Other times I just have a, an, a, just a page of lines and I just pick them at random, which are you know, my first pass through. I'm singing a vocal and I just see what sounds best and then I build the song up from that. You know, I think that sounds like a good chorus or, or something. Um, depending again what I want, what I want to convey in the song. If it's a specific, then I'd spend much more time deliberating over the correct choice of words. If it's more like a mood, you can get away with a lot more. Um, I mean, on. on this record, the, the, some of the writing is some of the best writing that I've ever done because it does actually convey very specific things. Whereas in the past, I've, if, if I've been a bit lazy, I've thought, oh, you know. Um, I've also in the past written very, quite obscure songs which I've never really bothered about people understanding. Whereas in this one, I've been a bit more careful about, you know, I suppose what I'm conveying and and. The, I realised that there's not that much ambiguity in a lot of the songs that we've done this time. No, they're very obvious what they're about. Hmm. But like Snake Pit, for instance. I mean, is there a particular um, location? Yeah, that was a particular incident that happened. That happened quite a while ago, and that I'd stuck in my mind. The, the, with a lot of those songs, that, that, um, and like Hot, 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 there, I, I sit there and I'll, I'll think, you know, I mean, not when we're doing the album, but at any time, and just when you have a reverie and. I might think of something that I haven't thought about in years, and I just make a note of the actual incident, so that then when I'm coming to to write, and I'll like think to myself, oh, what did I feel then? Because it's like some things that I experienced when I was younger, that, and that I'm probably not um, as aware of now. I'm not exposed to as much. You know, we, we, we were so you know we were far less cosseted than we are now. I'm really aware of it. So, in, in a lot of cases, I'm drawing on experience that happened before the cube started to become this successful because it's some um, it's a very false environment that I spend a lot of my time in there and I don't really want to write songs about being in hotel rooms or going on planes it's 
it's very tedious. So, like last year, I purposely took a, a couple of months away, and that's why we didn't do much live work. People say, why don't you play in our country, why don't you do this? But um, if I didn't experience things outside of the group, there'd be absolutely nothing for us to, to do that would be new for, for me. There'd be nothing fresh, and I'd, just, I'd get very tired of it very quickly. Given so the choice between real life and this, I'd, I'd rather take real life. So I'd rather have going? both. Um, just around England, you know, I just went off and saw the Lake District again and just went to Wales, just, you know, just, you know, just to have time just to, to sit and just be normal, really. So what is the uh, the incident or the location behind Snake Pit? Um, that was just happened, just some, that happened on someone's birthday a few years ago, you know. It was in a dis sort of a horrible disco. It's literal. It's just a, I was just taken somewhere in a car full of girls, just to, and it was really it was a dreadful experience. I shouldn't say too much about it. Really. Your voice seems to be uh, quite strong on the album. I mean, did you have uh, did you practice a lot for that, or, or had you just done some touring before we actually did the the uh, vocals on the album, or, or what? No, I, did, I hadn't done anything. We did that. We finished. The film in Orange in uh, August, I think, just at the end of August, and we went straight to the album. But no, I, I think it's much more mental that my singing. That the, I mean, the, the the approach is more, of, yeah, it's more of a mental approach so, rather than the physical thing. I mean, I think I always could have sung like this, but I, in the past, it hasn't suited me to. Like from through seventy seconds of faith and pornography. I mean, the the songs were sung. As I sang them, they were very, very plain. They were very simple, and I didn't ever need the. I, I never felt the need to affect my voice in any way. Um, since the top, I've experimented more with how I can sound, and on this one, I've gone quite peculiar on something like hot, hot, hot. You know, it's almost like gospel. Yeah, you conscious. It's, it's almost as if you consciously. I am. Do, yeah, I am doing it, but I never practice it. I I go out and I just do it, and then I come back in, and if the general consensus for looks on people's faces in the control room is like beaming and happy I think well I'd better listen to it back if they're all very sullen then I think you know maybe this isn't going to work but um Hot 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 was the most revolutionary departure really you know from anything that I've, like, I've sung before well Hot 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 is, is the first like really funky number for the cure isn't it mm. <laughs> yeah it's pure chic <laughs> um had you been listening to a lot of black music before you know that one you decided to do that one no, I mean a lot of the, the these songs were. Um, I mean a lot of what we do it involves things like hot, 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 and we will if we're doing a sound check or if we're in the studio or wherever we are. Particularly now, Boris is playing the drums, and he's like he can play any kind of rhythm, any kind of beat. You know, he can play like salsa or just anything. So he'll sort of start playing something, and everyone just joins in. And hot, hot, hot was one of those things. It was just like a bass line that I. would had and I was thinking this is a, like a really sort of typical sort of funk bass and I was just playing it to Simon and Boris just joining on, on the drums and I thought this would be really funny if we turned this into a song you know, and it's uh so Paul came out and just started playing sort of chicken picking guitar and like within half an hour we had the song so it's again it's really spontaneous it's just the sort of things I mean in the past we because I would have had a much more precise idea of what the record was supposed to be like, we, there was never any room to do things like that. I mean, which is good, you know. The the, the records have, have always had a reason behind them, and this one was really to capture what the group's like. And so things like that, if it sounded good and it worked, it, it was going to go on the record because there was no reason for it not to go on. I mean, obviously we didn't sit down, sit down and think, you know, we should do a funk song, <laughs> because we, it, if we thought like that, we would never actually do anything. You know, the only again, the only thing that. It's like that. It's country and western. Paul would always come and say, I've "Got this great country and western lick," you know, <laughs> knowing that I'm going to get extremely upset. <laughs> so, what's the song actually about? Is, is it? Is it? Were you going like more for the feel there, or for? Or is it actually trying to say something? Because all this business about lightning striking. Yeah, lightning striking is just a veiled term for um, a, a revelation. Again, I, can't, I shouldn't say too much about it. You sort of read into it what you want, really. It's a. It just seemed like an exciting phrase rather than saying the first time I realised that. Da, 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 I thought that first. You know, it, means, it is a phrase, and it's be struck by lightning when you suddenly realise something. A lot of the songs on on the album, I mean, including one more time, that they've all got 
quite long musical introductions to them before you actually hear some vocals on it. Did it, did it work out that because you had more input from the rest of the group that it turned out to be like a more, a more musical album? Yeah, certainly with the, with the slower ones, they could have been... Virtually all of them could have been longer. I, I had to edit quite a lot of them and um, or decide at the time that they were, they were going to be short because it would have turned into... I think it was in danger of rambling too much. I didn't know how many slow songs were going to go on and how many fast, and I thought, well, if the balance is tips, to, tips towards um, sort of five or six very long, very slow pieces, the record isn't going to be a fair reflection of what we're doing. But um, when we were going through them, we were actually just playing through before we started recording, we were very, very long. I mean, something like One More Time, we, were pl- we would play for like half an hour so that you would know all the bits that you could do in it and sort of all the little tunes that there might be. And, um, so, I mean, the, it was, it was, it's quite hard when you've got songs like that to decide how long they should be because I was always doing the vocals after the, the song and I'd just be doing rough guide vocals. I'd never know how emotional I was going to get and whether the intro should be longer or whether I should come in hard to the start of the song and then have a long outro. It's difficult to, to, to know those sort of things. And so a lot of it's like just gambling, really. I think it, it worked. I think that one more time, if we were to redo it, would be longer. It's the only song on the record that I would make longer. Um, it's something like Ice in Sugar, which is like just mental. I mean, it's like one of Simon's songs, you know, and Boris. It's just little drums and just like weird stuff. I mean, that was originally about eight minutes long. I mean, it had everything on it. It had like um, percussion and bird song and thunder. And you know, it's just one of those things that we just had like an enormous big slab of it, and everyone just put on what they wanted, and then it was like edited together to form like a, just a, a complete song. Like Cockatoos, I mean, is that like another literary one? Um, the title obviously comes from, from the Patrick, Patrick White. White book, yeah. But um, the song has nothing at all, there's no relevance to the book at all. But the sound at the beginning of it was actually, it's supposed to be a string section on the emulator and I just like, I was going through all the different sounds and I played and I, I thought, well, that sounds like you imagine like a big flock of birds taking off with something, and I thought, oh, it's just, and I thought to myself, it's like cockatoos. And so, to recognise the songs because they never have proper titles all the time. We're going through; it's like they're referred to as the, you know, like, oh, it was that chic one, or you know, the funk one, um, so that it doesn't influence me just to, you know, the, what the the content of the the words going to be finally. Because if you give them a title straight away, then you start always to think under that title. Um, so that one became like cockatoos because it was the one that had that sound like cockatoos. So it's, you know. Um, but it's actually nothing to do with with the book. But I mean, I, I mean, anyone who knows about the Cure knows that I have great fondness for all Patrick White's literature. I mean, it's influenced me in the past lyrically um, a couple, on a couple of songs, but not really on this record. The only literary one on the record is um, "How Beautiful You Are." There isn't really anything else because I didn't actually read anything which inspired me to write. Everything else just comes from direct experience, which is. Unusual, because there's usually two songs that are nicked. The Perfect Girl, I mean, was that written for anybody? Yeah. (laughs) Whoever's listening. (laughs) So, do you often write songs specifically for people, or is that like a new departure for you? I always have have, um, specifics in mind. Even if I'm writing like very general mood sort of songs, I always know exactly what... I mean, it would be impossible otherwise to write a song... Uh, well, I mean, it wouldn't be impossible, but it'd be very weak, I think, to just to sit down and put together a whole bunch of words just for the sake of it. I think it'd be, it'd be awful. Um, so I always know who I'm writing about. I mean, I'm the only person that knows. I would never tell. I mean, the rest of the group don't know either. I would never say because it. Um, I think it would sort of take away some of the mystery of the song. It'd also get me in a lot of trouble, I think, as well, if everyone knew exactly what all the songs were about. So that, that I mean, I always think that when I write songs and they have specific people in mind of specific events that those people or the people who were present at the, at the time know and no one else is going to but I mean the other good thing about not not saying exactly what they're about is that they can appeal to, to other people because they're not pinned down you've been with the same girl for what 14 years? yeah 15 yep. now I think. Are, you actually, are you married to her? no <laughs> no it's just a friendship <laughs> Does she criticise your work? Oh yeah, yeah. Do you take any notice of it? Yeah, a lot. 
I, um, particularly um, lyrically, she doesn't really musically because she doesn't write music, so I, I wouldn't take much notice. You know. And but lyrically, she's very critical. Yeah, she she often says, you know, you shouldn't sing that. It sounds stupid. I either agree or disagree. She doesn't ever impose herself on it. I mean, I I, I generally have to ask her opinion because she um, she knows how much I suppose it all means. So. I don't know, no, she, she, yeah, she contributes. She contributes as, as um, I mean, Simon's been going out with the same girl for about 12 or 13 years, and I saw I've known her for that long as well, so she sort of says, you know, I and mean, when I was doing vocals for this record, we had what was called the panel, which was Simon, Mary and Carol, and they, would, they were the three people out of everyone that I paid most attention to when I asked, you know, if, if I was doing a song like um, One More Time or A Thousand Hours, if it sounded convincing. When I was I was singing it like, and I was being very involved in what I was singing, and I wouldn't want a lot of people there. I would always have those three there, and Dave, who was like engineering, and I'd go in and I'd say, you know, does it sound right? And if they didn't think it sounded right, even though I knew that I was singing it like from the bottom of my heart, if I thought if they if it doesn't sound right to them, it's never going to sound right to anyone else. So, um, in that sense, I take notes. I take notes of uh, uh, the others in the group, like Boris, particularly for a lot of the structure of songs and the tempo so I mean everyone sort of within the Cure setup has their own um, particular role to play yeah I mean I don't I'm not sort of isolated to the degree where I take no notice and I mean as Mary has known me for so long she's obviously got an, more of an insight problem than anyone else into what I'm trying to do anyway Shiver and Shake that's a, a pretty angry song I mean do you have to be in a certain kind of mood to write lyrics like that yeah I, I that's a peculiar song actually to do because I, I, that was the one song that it took me I had about 20 goes probably singing that every day I would sort of half-heartedly have a go and it was only on one particular day really near the end of the recording when um, something happened and I thought right and it was like we were doing something else and I had a phone call and I thought right this is the moment and I just went and I said quick put on the tape shiver and shake and I went and just sang it in one go so it's um I like that vocal I think it's because it's all, it's just, you can tell it's just done and it's really raw. It's good. And it's all sort of breaks up and I don't quite hit the notes. I like that when I do vocals like that. Some of the others I took like quite a lot of time on, like working out what, how I should sing, like all I want. I, I sort of thought that through quite a few times to get it all in the right place. But um, as long as you've been shaped, it was just a rant, really. It was, it was good fun to do. Once I'd done it, I knew that um, that was the one song, even if it, if that hadn't sounded right, even if the entire vocal had been flat, it would have had to have stayed on because it had captured exactly how it, you know what the song was supposed to. But I actually wrote the words to it um, quite early last year. I had the words for a long time. So to write lyrics generally, I mean, do you, do you need to be in a particular mood, or do you, do you work best under pressure, or what? No, I don't. I work worst under pre well, under the manufactured pressure that you generally find in a recording studio. If you've in the past, I've gone in with less words than, than I needed and I've ended up sort of writing words that when I've, I look back at them I can see the songs that didn't have enough time spent on or, or were written under pressure but um, with this I mean I'd say out of the eight do I have the 25 or 27 songs about probably about 14 or 15 sets of lyrics were virtually written not, not, I never finish a set of words until it's actually sung. I mean, I'm changing it all the time, even when I'm out singing. But a, a lot of the ba basic ideas and the so like you know, a few lines were already there. So I, I knew I had more than enough to do a single album, which is all I envisaged doing when we went into the studio anyway. So I, there was no problem to to continue writing once we were there because recording at Miraville, um, which was like a vineyard, more than a studio really. It was just. Whereabouts is that? That's in France. That's in, yeah. yeah, in Provence. It, it was just so um, different to anywhere we've recorded before. We've always recorded in London or around London. It was just so glorious to to get up and and just walk outside. And it was just it was like autumn. It was really nice just to walk. You know, you could like sit in the middle of a field and just like finish off a set of words. And just there'd be nothing to 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 intrude. There's like no traffic. There's no people. There's no phones. It was just perfect. It was perfect isolation, really. I, I lived for like a month. It was just like the record, which is the first time I, I've been allowed to do that because always you come out of the studio and you you either you know you get into a cab and you you see the real world and it's raining and there's people going to work or whatever or 
um, and it sort of breaks the, the the atmosphere. Whereas with this, all all that we were the only reason we were there for a month was was just to make the record. And it was, as we demoed virtually everything in a little eight track studio for two weeks, and so we knew what was going to work and we knew that it was going to be good. The atmosphere was was really perfect. So there was lack of pressure, actually, that that's made it such a good record. The last track on the album is uh, is Fight. It's a pretty positive song, isn't it? Yeah, which is why we stuck it at the end. It's um, t- that's the most unusual song on the record, I think, f- from from the from a Cure point of view, from a historical point of view, because we've never really done a a positive song like that, lyrically as positive as that, where I'm actually saying do something about it. You know, it's usually like you, the songs you're either being cornered or you're being forced to do something. And this is like a, it's almost anthemic, really. It was sort of it's, there's like a pride involved in it, which I sort of felt when we were making the record and we were there, and I was thinking, it's so good that after all this time, we're still doing things which are better than what we've done before. I thought, and it's disproving all, you know, again, historically what happens to groups and how they're supposed to creatively dry up and get worse and get very flabby and sort of and lose touch and all the other things that, that do happen to 99% of groups after, like, the first, well, I mean, mostly it's like the first week it appears, but generally after, the, like, the first two records. Um, and it's just, I, I was just really felt pleased. Now I've just translated that into when I was starting of how I felt, which is the same as I feel now, about... Um, Sort of not believing in other people's criticism, you know, and of actually like doing something about it. I mean, the reason why the group started was was a very positive re- was for very positive reasons was to react against the dross, you know, and it's that's still the the central reason why the group continues because I still think like this is that's as good as this. Recently, there's been a few well, there's been a few that are as good as like Kate Bush's album is as good as this. Sounds definitely big-headed, doesn't it? But I mean, just from my point of view, what I like, and that if I was, like I was saying earlier, of looking at the group from an outsider's point of view, um, I think it's the the best thing we've done. So I mean, I thought there had to be a song in it that translates that sort of pride, you know. It's, but it was funny singing it. It was a very, very strange feeling, and, and, and listening back to it, it was very strange. So I think, you know. So it sort of like surges into this you know, rise up and fight sort of chorus. Yeah, I can, yeah, I can just see them punch in the air now. <laughs> oh dear. Now I believe you also uh, filmed a, a concert in Orange, which is coming out soon, called uh, The Cure in Orange. Uh, when, why did you want to do a concert film? Um, again, it all it was all part of this sort of. There was a very retrospective air about everything last year, and the group had re- reached a point. We we played in America. And I thought that we had reached a point with like the songs we were playing and the lineup as it was, and this, just the show that was had to end last year. And and I thought, well, it would be really nice just to capture it. Initially, it was just for our own benefit. We were going to film it, you know, just like a video, and just have it and say, you know, that 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 was me. You know, that, like we thought about it and um, thought how we could do it. And we got Tim Pap interested in, you know, he'd never made like a full length film. And the more we talked about it, the found the easier it would be to do because, like, we were presenting ourselves on stage anyway with a with a light show, and we were playing the songs that we, you know, it was all there. It wasn't like we had to actually do anything. So once we roped him in and got him interested in it, he he sort of just took the whole thing over. And and I mean, it's really his film. It's his. Um, it's his first pers- feature film, isn't it? Yeah, it's his perspective on us playing a concert. See, he felt that he over the past sort of four years, he's made the cure too small he's like very worried about having put us in always onto a small screen and only showing really one side visually of what what we are which is like he's always taken up the more humorous side to what we do and he wanted to redress the balance as well by making a film which is i mean it looks enormous and the 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 place was picked especially he sort of went down there and said you know that there's these old amphitheaters in the south of france and it would just look really perfect if you play there so it's you know it's his film he's directing it we had all we did was just we played the concert and he was supposed to capture it. But the thing is, it's like it's also from on stage. He w- came on stage and it's n- it's not a film of a concert. It's far more than that. And there's there's a lot of sort of surprising things in it, which it's unlike anything that anyone's seen before. I mean, as it would be with Tim doing it. Again, it's, it's like when we go out and, and play concerts this year, it'll be a completely new batch of songs. I mean, it'll be, even be a different lineup. We're going to have. We're going to add a six member. Who's that going to be? Year. 
Um, I'm not allowed to say it because he's still he's with another group at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> We're stealing him. <laughs> is he well known? Um, no, the group is a. So, how important do you think your image is to you these days? Um, I think the the group image is really important. I never think of my of me having an image. It's like a, if I know that I can cut my hair off like I did last year, I know that it still matters as little to me as it always has. Um, I, I mean, I look how I choose to look. It has nothing really to do with being in a group. You know, I, I've got my hair back now as to what it was like this time last year because I feel like it. I think it looks better on me than short hair. Um, but um, the actual image of the group we think about, because obviously like with five and there's going to be six of us, I mean, it's even more difficult to have like a coherent image rather than... Um, I, I wouldn't like the group to, to, for it to sort of like be seen as, as five people. I much, you know, even though there are five people involved, I, I much prefer to look at the group as a, like a unified front, like, like an us against them sort of idea. Um, but I think it's far less a visual thing, a Cure's image, than w w how we do things. And people sort of, the image is built up through what we don't do as much as what we do do. You know, it certainly has nothing to do with us um, all wearing the same shirts. It's go it goes much deeper than that. We've always had a very sort of proud and very obstinate attitude towards what we do in that we do it for ourselves and we do it for people like us who are going to like it and so we never feel like anyone's doing us any favours by um, allowing us to to be played on the radio when we think that we should be played on the radio and seen all the time so it's um but it it's just when people know that they know what we're like and they know that we're very dismissive of the whole thing and of that sort of the very unimportant side of being in a group but um that's the sort of image that I worry about. I mean, it'd be awful if we, if we, we sort of went soft. The whole thing would fall to pieces, I think. Does your self-confidence increase with success? I've always had confidence in what I've done because I know that by the time it gets to the point where other people um, can get their hands on it or can listen to it, I've already agonised about it so much that I know it's right. Um, I mean, it's right f for me. I mean, in that sense, I'm very selfish about everything that we do. But... Um, no, I've always been self-confident. I've, I've ne that, that you can be sort of quiet and self-confident. And you know, I'm, I'm not a very extrovert person in, in public. I mean, I am in the videos and I am on stage. I, suppose. I mean, I must be to even walk out on stage. But I don't seek attention, and so I'm sort of I'm not quietly confident. <laughs> it's <laughs> not very cliche, not very hackneyed. Do you feel any like sense of responsibility to set an example to some of the, the young fans? I, I, this the one difficult area of us becoming popular is me having to come to terms with that, that people see me in a they see me as someone larger than life, and I can never get used to it because it's the same people, like particularly like being with Mary, and I'd never think of myself as anything other than me, and it, it's um. It's difficult when you know that everything you're doing, like when we're here, is going to be reported on and photographed, and I can't sort of throw up in a club anymore like I used to without worrying about the consequences, you know. But um, again, I think a lot of the people, I would imagine that a lot of people like us because we do do what we want and we are normal, and, we, and I don't really need to think about setting a, an example because I set an example to myself, so I don't really have to worry about anyone else. I, I, I mean, I hate myself if I do something, if I the next day I think, you know, why on earth did I say that? Why did I do that? Um, so over the course of the years I've I've got used to sort of thinking probably more than other people do um, about what, what I'm going to do, if it's going to affect anyone else. I, I never bother if, it's, if, if, it, if it isn't. But um, So I'd, it's at the same time, I don't feel responsible in the way of like thinking, hey kids, you know, like this is your Uncle Robert saying don't do this. But I, I haven't done anything over the past few years which I wouldn't want anyone to know about anyway, so I, I don't have to agonise over it too much. I, d I don't think that I should be forced... I mean, I've always absolved myself of that sort of responsibility. I don't see why I should be forced on me just because our records are popular. I mean, I, that's why I don't put myself forward. I try not to very much, I mean, less and less. Does, uh, does the absurdity of the whole uh, music business and the whole thing ever ever strike you? Um, no more so than life. No, I mean because we're not really involved. We never see it. We never go to anything that's music busy. So um, the whole thing about um, 
the selling of records and the complete disregard for what they contain horrifies me, doesn't it? It strikes me as particularly absurd. The the race to be number one, that the whole way that, that people conduct themselves and the the um, emphasis being geared on sales and success and, and over over a period of time you become so aware that no one really gives a toss what you're actually doing apart from the people that will will take it home and listen to it you know, and it's so I mean I always think of the link between me and the person that's going to listen to what we do or see the concert I never ever spend any time worrying about what goes on in between because it, it goes everything's done within the whole little cure world and then it's just like you know it's sort of shipped out we give birth to it and it's there it's really complete and all people have got to do is listen to it if they want to or experience it if they want to in the in the videos that you do it seems like lol always draws the short straw when it comes to being lol tortured. drew the short straw when he dropped from his mother's womb <laughs> is this a master plan you've got to to always make lol suffer in the video well, lol i think the the reason why Lowell's always been in the group is because he's always been that foil for that side of my character in particular. And he's always been willing to put up with it. I mean, he, what you don't see is him giving it all back. Um, but that, you know, He has become... Well, I mean, he always has been the scapegoat. It's just it's developed in, in the videos particularly because Pat sees it and sort of draws it out. You know, it's, it's just natural, really. He's picked on by everyone. He's like a real sort of Stan Laurel personality. Everyone picks on him. Doesn't seem to mind though, he relishes it. Do you believe in God? Uh, I don't know, no, I don't believe in God really. I, I have a, in my worst moments I have belief in absolutely nothing. I think everything's just as it seems. But don't you believe in yourself? I don't, I, quite often, I mean, more, most of the time I have no belief in my own existence after I die, no. I don't at all. This is a very deep, which is where all the the depression comes from, and a lot of the songs. I mean, it's it's such a everything's so hollow if you actually feel like that, and you can't ever shake it. And I, I don't know. I went mean, through a very cynical phase. I still there's still vestiges of it, which I, I only leads me to believe that people have faith because they're scared I and mean, that they, they won't accept their own their, their own finite nature. But I don't know. I mean, if you believe something, it's true. So it's it's one of those things. I mean, I confront it all the time. Every time I go up in an aeroplane, I confront my. Does that bother you? Flying? Yeah. Every every fibre of my being screams that I shouldn't be up there. I think you've got to. It's like if you just think, you know, like beneath your feet, well, there's there's nothing. You're um, it's just survival instinct. It's like I tingle all over. I hate hate flying. I wouldn't stop it though, if you're being scared, because that would be admitting. That you were scared of your, you know, of your own death, which I don't really think I am. Can you see a finite end to it? Not in real terms, but I, I can in, a, in an, a, an abstract way. Yeah, I can see me not having to do an interview and not having to get up in the morning to play a concert. But um, I don't sort of think about it. I think it will present itself very naturally. I've always thought that, even when we hadn't even made the first album, I always thought that the end of the, of the group would present itself very naturally. I. I thought for a while in 1982 that I would that it would stop, and that after pornography that we wouldn't do anything else, and then it just sort of like tumbled into the next sort of bit of the cure. So um, I think it'll be really obvious when we stop. It would, I'll just sort of wake up. I think I think, oh God, you know, this isn't appealing anymore. But um, when it comes, it will be it will be easy to stop because our commitments are always kept very. You know, I always make sure that they're never that far in advance, so that it allows me the freedom to wake up and and think oh, I don't really want to do this much, much, much longer.